the first year students. The ninth lecture on the subject English literature is devoted to the theme English literature of the 17th century and the restoration period. Objectives. This lecture will make the students know about historical overview of restoration age, its social political happenings and its impact on the literary production of the age, literary features of the age, prose, poetry and drama of the period the main writers and their works of literature. The plan of the lecture. The first, the historical background of the period, English literature of the restoration period. A. Francis Bacon. B. John Bunyan. C. John Dryden. And the second question, John Milton and his great poem Paradise Lost. The first half of the 17th century as a whole, compared with the Elizabethan age, was a period of relaxing vigor. The Renaissance enthusiasm had spent itself and in place of the da danger and glory which had long united the nation, there followed increasing dissension in religion and politics and uncertainty as to the future of England and in need as to the whole purpose of life. Through increased experience, men were certainly wiser and more sophisticated than before, but they were also more self-conscious and sadder and more pensive. The output of literature did not diminish, but it spread itself over wider fields in general fields of somewhat recondite scholarship rather than its creation. Nevertheless, the spirit includes in prose one writer greater than any prose writer of the previous century, namely Francis Bacon, and further the book which unquestionably occupies the highest place in English literature, that is the King James Version of the Bible. And in poetry it includes one of the very greatest figures, John Milton, together with a varied and highly interesting assemblage of lesser lyrists. The 17th century was marked by the important events in English history. The most important is the 17th century bourgeois revolution. The contradiction between feudal and bourgeoisie sharpened and reached their climax. The bourgeoisie once had supported the queen, turned against absolute monarchy, which was no longer progressive and hindered the first development of capitalism in England. The struggle between two sides continued during the reign of Charles I. The House of Commons worked out the petition of rights aimed at limiting the king's power and the king had to sign it. The Charles I dissolved the parliament and ruled aristocratically for 11 years till 1640. Those who supported the king were called royalists, those who supported the commons were called the Puritans. In 1642, the king declared war on parliament and the civil war began between the royalists and the parliamentarians and lasted till 1649. The parliamentary army headed by Oliver Cromwell consisted of the representatives of bourgeoisie, gentry, artisans and other working people. Oliver Cromwell, the leader of independence in long parliament, demanded an overthrow of the monarchy. The royalists were defeated because the masses took the sides of parliament and thus the bourgeoisie revolution triumphed. Charles I was beheaded in 1649. The House of Lords was abolished and Republican and Commonwealth was proclaimed. Later, frightened by revolutionary spirit of masses, Cromwell imposed the military dictatorship in 1653. As neither the common people nor the upper classes were satisfied with the results of the Puritan Revolution, the monarchy was restored after Cromwell's death. Charles II ascended the throne in 1660. The years between 1660 and 1668 are called the Restoration. By that time, two main parties had been formed in Parliament. One is representing the interests of businessmen, the other of landowners and clergy. In 1689, King James II left for France and the English crown was offered to his daughter Mary Stuart. This period was known as the Glorious Revolution. It wasn't the People's Revolution, but the agreement between bourgeoisie and aristocracy. Constitutional monarchy was established, which exists up to nowadays. The political struggle involving broad masses influenced English literature greatly. It was the time of the publication of political pamphlets and the time when English journalism and the periodical press appeared. Restoration period was marked by the names of such writers as Francis Bacon, John Bunyan and John Dryden. 
Francis Bacon, intellectually one of the most eminent Englishmen of all times and chief formulator of the methods of modern science, was born in 1561, three years before Shakespeare. The son of Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal under Queen Elizabeth and one of her most trusted early advisors. The boy's precocity led the Queen to call him her little Lord Keeper. At the age of 12, he, like White, was sent to Cambridge, where the, his chief impression was a disgust at the unfruitful scholastic application of the Aristotle's ideas, still supreme in spite of a century of Renaissance enlightenment. A very much more satisfactory three years' residence in France in the household of the English ambassador was terminated in 1579. By the death of Sir Nicholas, Bacon was now ready to enter on the great career for which his talents fitted him, but his uncle by marriage, Lord Budley, though all-powerful with the Queen, systematically threatened him progress, from Julius' con consciousness of his superiority to his own son. Bacon therefore studied law and was soon chosen a member of parliament where he quickly became a leader. He continued, however, throughout his life to devote much of his time to study and scholarly scientific writing. On the interpretation of Bacon's public actions depends the answer to the complex and much debated question of his character. The most reasonable conclusion seemed to be that Bacon was sincerely devoted to the public good and in his early life was sometimes ready to risk his own interest in its behalf. That he had a perfectly clear theoretical insights into the principles of moral conduct, that he lacked the moral force of character to live on the level of his convictions, so that after the first, at least, his personal ambition was often stronger than his conscience. Bacon's splendid mind and unique intellectual vision produced perhaps inevitably considering his public activity only fragmentary concrete achievements. The only one of his books still commonly read is the series of essays, which consist of brief and contemporary informal jottings in, on various subjects. In their earliest form in 1597, the essays were 10 in number, but by additions, from time to time they had increased, at last in 1625 to 58. They deal with a great variety of topics, whatever Bacon happened to be interested in, from friendship to the arrangement of a house, and in their condensation, they are more like bare synopsis than complete discussions. But their comprehensiveness of view, sureness of ideas and phrasing, suggestiveness and illustrations reveal the pregnancy and practical force of Bacon's thought. The whole general tone of the essays also shows the man keen and worldly, not at all a poet or idealist. John Bunyan was born in 1628 at the village of Elstow, just outside the Bedford in central England. After very slight schooling and some practice at his father's trade of tinker, he was in 1644 drafted for two years and a half into garrison service in the parliamentary army. Released from this occupation, he married a poor but excellent wife and worked at his trade. But the important experiences of his life were the religious ones. Endowed by nature with great moral sensitiveness, he was nevertheless a person of violent impulses and had early fallen into profanity and lax laxity of conduct, which he later described with great exaggeration as a condition of abandoned weakness. But from childhood his uh, abnormally active dramatic imagination had terminated him with dreams and fears of devils and fell uh, hellfire and now he entered on a long and agonizing struggle between his religious instinct and his obstinate self-will. He has told the whole story in the spiritual autobiography Grace Abandoning to the Chief of Sinners, which is one of the notable religious books of the world. Several of Banyan's books are strong, but none of the others is to be named together with The Pilgrim's Progress. This has been translated into nearly or quite a hundred languages and dialects, a record never approached by any other book of English authorship. The sources of its power are obvious. It is the intensely sincere presentation by a man of tremendous moral energy of what he believed to be the one subject of internal and incalculable importance to every human being, the subject namely of personal salvation. Its language and style further are founded on the noble and simple model of the English Bible, which was almost the only book that Banyan knew. 
and Graydon, the son of a family of Northamptonshire country gentry, was born in 1631. From Westminster School and Cambridge, he went at about the age of 26 and possessed by inheritance of a minimum living income to London, where he perhaps hoped to get political preferment through his relatives and the Puritan party. His serious entrance into literature was made comparatively late, in 1659 with a eulogizing poem on Cromwell of the occasion of the latter's death. When the next year Charles II was restored, Dryden shifted to the royalist side and wrote some poems in honor of the king. Dryden's character should not be judged from his incidents in similar ones in his later life too hastily, nor without regard to the spirit of the times. Dryden, who, with the daughter of an earl two or three years after the restoration, secured his social position and for more than 15 years thereafter his life was outwardly successful. He first turned to the drama. In spite of the prohibitory Puritan war, a facile writer Sir William Davenant had begun cautiously a few years before the restoration to produce operas and other works of dramatic nature, and the returning court had brought uh, from Paris a passion for the stage, which therefore offered the best and indeed the only field for remunerative literary effort. Accordingly, although Dryden himself frankly admitted that his talents were not especially adapted for writing plays, he proceeded to do so energetically and continued at, at it, it diminishing productivity nearly down to the end of his life, 35 years later. But in 1680, an outrage of which he was the victim, a brutal and unprovoked beating inflicted by ruffians in the employ of the Earl of Rochester, seems to mark a permanent change for the worse in his fortunes, a change not indeed to disaster, but to a permanent condition of doubtful prosperity. The next year he became engaged in political controversy, which resulted in the production of his most famous work. In his comedies and in comic portions of the others, Dryden, like other English dramatists, uses prose for its suggestion of everyday reality. In place of serious tone, he often turns to blank verse, and this is the meter of all for love. But early in his dramatic career, he almost contemporaneously with other dramatists introduced the rhymed couplet, especially in his heroic plays. Dryden himself at any rate finally grew tired of it and returned to blank verse. Dryden's work in other forms of verse also is of high quality. Dryden's prose, only less important than his verse, is mostly in the form of long critical essays, virtually the first in English and which are prefixed to many of his plays and poems. Dryden did perhaps more than any other man to form modern prose style, a style clear, straightforward, tense, forceful, easy and simple and yet dignified, fluent in vocabulary, varied and of pleasant rhythm. Dryden's general quality and a large part of his achievement are happily summarized in Lowell's epigram that he was the greatest poet who ever was or ever could be, wholly out of prose. He can never again be a favorite with the general reading public, but he still always remains one of the conspicuous figures in the history of English literature. He wrote poetic plays, including the famous one about Anthony and Cleopatra, All for Love, and many lyrics, also literary criticism and political satires, which were the outcome of the Puritan royalist controversies. He was often called the father of English prose. John Milton, the greatest of all republics of the period of the Puritan Revolution. His pamphlets give political foundation to the struggle. He was born in London in 1608 in the family of prosperous Scrivener. At first he attended St. Paul's School. His progress was very rapid and at the age of 16 he entered the University of Cambridge. Later he retired and gave himself to study of poetry. Many of his poems were written there. These poems comprise the first period of his creative work. In 1637, he left England for an European tour. He visited France and Italy. Later, he will mention this meeting in his book Paradise Lost. In 1639, he returned to England and the years between 1640 and 1660 were the second period of his literary work, during which he wrote mainly revolutionary pamphlets. Most of them were written in Latin because Milton wanted Europe to understand what the Puritan revolution in England wasn't rebellion, but it was the only force which could give the people rights and freedom.
Milton had very weak eyes and in 1652 he lost his eyesight completely. With the restoration of the monarchy, Milton was discharged from the office and his pamphlets were burnt. He moved to a small house near London and devoted himself to the writing of poetry. These years of his retirement were the third period of his work. During this period, he created the most famous work, his great epic Paradise Lost, and his second epic Paradise Regained, in 1671. The plot of many of his works were taken from the Bible. One of the most popular of his epics were Paradise Lost. It was very unusual, not from the viewpoint of plot, but from the viewpoint of the main hero, because it was Satan. The other heroes are God, angels and three guardian angels, Raphael, Gabriel and Michael, Adam and Eve. Satan symbolized revolutionary spirit. He revolts against God and was driven out of heaven into the fires of hell. He hates God who rules autocratically. Uh, here Milton meant the king. The second line of the plot deals with Adam and Eve. They were allowed to live in paradise in the Garden of Eden as long as they don't eat the apples from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan turns at night and persuades Eve to eat the forbidden fruit from the tree. Eve did it and gave it to Adam for the sake of love. When God learned it, he drew them out of paradise and they had to face the life of toil. Adam in Milton's poem is an embodiment of energy, courage, mainly beauty, and Eve is that of woman perfection and charm. Milton sympathizes with these characters and shows his deep belief and faith in men. Adam and Eve were like humanists of Renaissance. Further, Milton's personal English and Puritan prejudice sometimes intrude in various ways, but all of these things are on the surface. In sustained imaginative grandeur of conception, expression, and imaginary paradise lost yields to no human work, and in the majestic and varied movement of the blank verse, here first employed in a real great non-dramatic English poem, is as magnificent as anything else in literature. Stately and more familiar passages alike show that however much his experience had gone uh, to harder Milton's Puritanism, his youthful Renaissance love of beauty for beauty's sake had lost none of its strength, though of course it could not longer be expressed with youthful lightness of fancy and melody. The poem is a magnificent example of classical art in the best Greek spirit united with a glowing romantic feeling. In his second poem, Paradise Regained, was different from the first one, though it was also based on the Bible. It was because Milton disappointed with the results of Puritan Revolution and Restoration. There is no uh, that active protest that can be seen in the first poem. Milton concentrated his attention on the Cain's murder of his brother Abel. In his tragedy, Samson agonists, the great hero Samson, was betrayed by his wife. He cut his hair in which was his power, that's why he was imprisoned and blind. But he managed to destroy his enemies though he perishes himself. Partly this very tragedy may be considered autobiographically. He died in 1674 and was buried in London. His works form a sort of bridge between the poetry of Renaissance period and the poetry of the classics. Milton's works are characterized by their quality, uh, which means that two independent views go together. Concluding the lecture, we can say the English Civil War from 1642 to 1651 was a civil war between the people of England that wanted to change their government from a more traditional form of government to a more republican government that involved the people. Between 1642 and 1660, Cromwell outlawed theatre because of its connections with the monarchy and, according to his Puritan values, were immoral. John Bunyan came from the village of Elstow near Bedford. He had some schooling and, at the age of 16, joined the parliamentary army during the first stage of the English Civil War. After three years in the army, he returned to Elstow and took up the trade of tinker, which he had learned from his father. He became interested in religion after his marriage, attending first the parish church and then joining the Bedford meeting, a non-conformist group in Bedford, and becoming a preacher. This is the end of the lecture. In order to consolidate it, use the given revision questions.
At the end, you are given a list of terms of the lecture. Be ready to use the given references for further learning.